All right, and we're off. So this episode of the podcast is going to be a little bit different. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube or on Spotify, you'll see that I'm sitting here alone today. And I know that this is not ideal. Uh, honestly, I think I'd like to do every podcast with a guest. Uh, I think I just work better talking with somebody you can bounce ideas off of. And I think it breaks up the podcast so that it might not feel like such a monologue. Hopefully this episode won't be you know, terribly long. I'm going to try to keep it under an hour because there is no guest. But honestly, for this book today, I couldn't find a guest. So my book today is The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William L. Schreier. And this book comes recommended by a lot of podcasters that I listen to, a lot of, you know, different individuals that I follow, as well as, you know, just a general search for World War II books and, you know, important historical books. This book kind of tops near or is near the top of just about every list that there is. And uh, after reading it, I can definitely see why it is a very, very, very thorough account of World War II, of the Nazi party, and of Hitler. And there's a lot to learn from this book. However, this book is also 59 or no, 57 hours and 11 minutes on Audible. So as you can well imagine, it was difficult to find anybody within my circle of friends and family who were willing to read this book with me and as of right now, because the podcast is still pretty new, that is my pool of guests. So if you're somebody listening and you, you're wanting to be a guest on the podcast or you know somebody who would be interested in being on the guest, you know, I'm always looking for more guests. But for today, it is just me re, uh, going over this book. And I still really wanted to read this book, even though it is just me, mostly because again, of the recommendations that I read from other podcasters and from other individuals. And also, it's a little bit different from a lot of the books that I've already read and from the books that are kind of up and coming here on my list. I don't really have just a straight historical book on my list. And this one is definitely that. It almost feels kind of textbook-like. Um, it is definitely more interesting than a textbook. And they're were parts of the book that I was, you know, absolutely drawn into and I felt like, you know, moved quickly and were very entertaining. There were sections of the book as well that were kind of dry and a little bit slower, but that's the, just the nature of a, you know, 57 hour long book. You definitely have some, some slow spots that happen in there. However, I think William Schreier does a very good job throughout the book of, you know, moving the pace along as well as being very historically accurate and drawing primarily from firsthand records. So William L. Schreier was a war correspondent as well as a journalist. Um, he was actually alive during World War One and World War II. And throughout much of the book, William talks about, you know, his experience in Nazi Germany, his experience with Germans, and kind of what he saw while actually living and being there throughout the Third Reich. So that was really interesting and, and just kind of a, a unique perspective that I don't think you're going to get from somebody who's just retelling history. Um, it's always cool just to read something from somebody who actually lived through history. In addition to that, he also primarily pulls from firsthand experiences. So he doesn't do a lot of like he said, she said, and you know, this and this and that, and pull from other historical texts or anything like that. He doesn't write from any his, you know, he doesn't quote a lot of other authors. What he pulls primarily from is going to be firsthand accounts of other individuals. So he uses a lot of diary entries from the leaders of the Nazi party. He uses a lot of direct quotes from speeches, and he uses a lot of the testimonies that were given from the Nuremberg trials that kind of shed some light on the Nazi party and everything that they did. So it made it very accurate, in my opinion, and it also made it seem like it was being told from the perspective of somebody that was actually there that from every point, um, you know, 
it wasn't just an analysis of World War II and of the Nazi Party. It was a complete history of World War II, the Nazi Party, being told from somebody who was there at every point. And I just felt like that was super entertaining and well worth the read. So the other thing that I the thing that I learned from this book was that my public education completely failed me. So I think I learned more about Hitler, the Nazi Party, and World War II in reading this book than I learned throughout, you know, every history class I've ever taken, you know, middle school, high school, and college. I don't think that I learned I mean, hardly anything that I read in this book, which was shocking considering how important World War II was to us as a nation, as well as to the world as a whole. And, you know, some of the things that I feel like you should learn from your public education is the why and the how to World War II. Like, what led to World War II? What was the reason driving the Nazis? What was the reason driving the Allied forces? What were the actual conflicts that led to World War II? As well as, you know, how did this happen? How did we get to a point in history where, I mean, concentration camps were able to kill millions and millions of individuals, where, you know, one nation was able to start to take over most of your most of Europe and all of these horrific things that happened throughout World War II, how did we how did we get there? And honestly, before reading this book, I don't think I could have answered those questions, which makes me a little sad um, and also makes me kind of reaffirm the opinion that I think we're going to end up homeschooling our kids because that definitely should not happen. You should have a solid foundation of... World War II and other major historical events, because if you don't study history, then how are you going to learn from it and prevent those things in the future? And so I think this podcast, again, was created in order to learn more through reading, but I definitely am going to spend some time picking and choosing historical books that will help me learn about these major events, because it was pretty eye-opening reading this book about how much I didn't know about the Nazi party, about Hitler, about World War II in general. And so I just wanted to kind of start talking about some of the things that I learned, some of the things that I found interesting about um, about all of these subjects and that I learned from the book. However, I'm not going to go detailed through every step of the process, um, starting with the whole the whole rise and the whole fall of the Third Reich. There's going to be a lot of gaps here. And yeah, I mean, obviously with a book... This thorough, there's no way that I could include every single event and um, even really every important event of that time period. However, I'm just going to pick and choose some of the ones that I felt like were important and things that I didn't know or kind of hit me a little bit differently um, while reading this book. So first off, I wanted to start off with the stories from Hitler's youth. So... I kind of knew that Hitler was maybe not the most, I mean, didn't come, come out of the womb as a, you know, Nazi warlord battle tested individual who was just, you know, rearing to go and super ambitious from the start. I I think I had heard that from quite a bit of people, but I didn't know quite to the extent as to what his life looked like pre Nazi party. And he was definitely not your stereotypical dictator. I mean, he was a nobody. He was kind of a, you know, I mean, he was somebody who didn't like to work hard. He was trying to avoid getting a real job. In fact, he never really even had a real job before he was drafted into the military. He wanted to be an artist, but he couldn't get into art school and then eventually thought, ah, maybe I'll be an architect and still couldn't get into architect school. And he basically lived his life avoiding any sort of responsibility, real job, or um, you know, kind of contributing to society in any major way. Not what you would expect from somebody who eventually would overthrow a government, become supreme dictator, and wage a world war. Um, Definitely not the picture that I envisioned for somebody 
who would end up doing that. But that was, you know, kind of where it all started. Even in his youth, though, while he was you know, kind of trying to find his way and wasn't very, I would, I would almost call him directionless. He still, at, in his youth, developed this German nationalist ideals and also his anti-Semitic beliefs. And no one really knows why um, or where the anti-Semitic beliefs came from. I mean, I've read, and I've read a couple different accounts as to why. Hitler was so anti-Semitic, and I think, you know, I've heard really anything from, you know, his ex- some of his, you know, sexual experiences with Jews before, uh, while he was a young man, to, you know, anything from he was, he listened to some of philosophers and some, you know, German intellectuals who were anti-Semitic, and it just kind of resonated with him, but all in all, he, in Mein Kampf, he just states that the anti-Semitic views started to come to light to him while he was living in Vienna as a young man, and he just started noticing more and more and more about what he would eventually call the Jewish problem. And everything that went wrong with Germany, he would then subsequently blame on the Jews and their influence throughout the world. And this was a pattern that would happen over and over and over throughout basically his entire life, you know, World War One, World War Two, all of the battles, basically blaming England's activity into World War One or World War Two on the Jews. I mean, he was constantly using the Jews as his scapegoat for basically anything that went wrong in his life. It really was a way for him to shirk responsibility, in my opinion. So it was an easy answer for it's not me or it's not Germans or it's not Germany as a whole. We don't have to take responsibility for our actions. We don't have to take responsibility for our current situations. Instead, we can just blame it on something else. And it was something that would plague him for the rest of his life. And eventually, I think that led to part of the downfall of the Third Reich was the inability to accept responsibility for some of his actions. And then that would ultimately lead towards him making more and more and more bad decisions. And we'll kind of dive into that a little bit deeper. But he was... So he had developed these feelings, and then he eventually got drafted into World War I. And that was something that I also didn't know. So again, reading this book, I was a little bit surprised. I didn't know that Hitler had fought in World War I. And it was also, I mean, I guess it had made it would make sense that Hitler had fought in World War I, just looking at timelines. I mean, the distance between World War I and, the, not the distance, but the, the time difference between World War I and World War II was not a whole lot of time. I believe I was... I had looked it up prior to this, but I believe it was 16 years of democracy within Germany between the end of World War I and Hitler and the Nazi party taking over the the German um, Reichstag and the German democracy there. And so there really isn't a whole lot of time in between these two wars. So it makes sense that Hitler would have fought. Um, again, I don't really know why this is something that I never knew and kind of shocking that we just don't know or not taught more about Hitler's life. But Hitler served as an infantryman um, in at the start of World War or in his the start of his service in World War One. And it is a little bit, I mean, I guess cruel fate that he was able to survive in this time. So when surrounded by so much death he was able to survive, which is crazy because then he would ultimately go on to cause even more death and, you know, how different the world would have been had just a few circumstances just slightly changed. So for instance, while serving as an infantryman, he was in some armed conflict. I'm not quite sure. I don't have it in my notes as to really which conflict it was, but his regiment entered battle with 3,600 men but by the end of battle, there were only 611 left. And then Hitler's own company, 
there were 250 men in his company and it was reduced to 42 men. So that is less than one fifth. So one in, you know, so four out of five men in that company were killed in that battle. And he was able to beat the odds and survive. I mean, you're talking pretty minimal odds. There was death all around Hitler and somehow he was able to squeeze out and survive World War I. Um, and not only did he squeeze out, because my initial thought was like, okay, well, maybe, you know, he was somewhat of a coward and he was, you know, able to just get by by not actually being in the war. But not a whole lot is known about Hitler's time in World War I. You know, there's no, you know, record of in, intense bravery or anything that he did that you know, really drew attention to him specifically. However, he was given two decorated uh, awards for bravery while serving in the military. He was given the Iron Cross second class in 1914 and the Iron Cross first class in 1918, which was the Iron Class first Iron Cross first class was a little bit. Um, it was kind of an honor to be given to him because his rank at the time as a lance corporal that wasn't very frequent, I and mean, it was a rare occurrence that they would he would get such a high reward. And he was again not a lot known about him during the war. However, again, just surrounded by death and was able to escape it at every moment. But the war did have a very significant impact on him. So, on October fifteenth of nineteen eighteen. He and several comrades were attacked by British forces. There was mustard gas used, and a you know a, a group of them were taken to the hospital because they were bl temporarily blinded due to this mustard gas. Again, just another instance where you could think like, oh my gosh, history could have changed in an instant had something happened to Hitler at that time. But he was able to survive um, while in the hospital recovering from this blindness he was told that Germ Germany had been defeated and that they were surrendering to the Allied forces. And he writes here, um, I think he wrote this actually in Mein Kampf when, you know, thinking back on his life, he said, when I was uh, confined to bed, the idea came to me that I would liberate Germany and that I would make it great. I knew immediately that it would be realized. So again, it was during this wartime of Hitler's that had such a profound impact on him that kind of changed him from this, you know, free spirit, free, um, you know, free individual who was trying to get by life without having to do a real job to somebody who had decided to make a real difference and that he was going to have a purpose and have a have a direction that he was running to in his life. And coming out of the war, he didn't really know what that looked like. Um, I think the book states that he was trying to create maybe a, a new party within Germany. So Germany at the time was now a democratic republic, and there were tons of political parties. So it's not like the United States where, you know, really we're, we're a two-party system. I mean, ultimately, there are a couple other parties, but... It's a two-party system. You're either Republican or you're Democrat. Within the German um, democratic system, I want to say, I mean, it was more than 10 different um, you know, major political parties, and there were new political parties that popped up all the time. So they would pop up and they would disappear, and they would, you know, some would gain traction and some wouldn't. But ultimately, you could basically just go through and create your own political movement and have your own set of ideals and move forward. And Hitler was thrown around the idea of starting his own political party when he found the nationalist, the German National Socialist um, Party, and that would eventually become the Nazi Party. And he was, you know, a gifted orator. He was, you know, really, you know, smooth talker, and he eventually got to the point where he took over the Nazi Party completely and became the head of that party. So another fun fact. Hitler didn't even start the Nazi party, didn't know that. And the Nazi party kind of provided everything that Hitler was looking for in a party. So he was looking for a strong 
German nationalist outlook, meaning that he was looking for somebody who believed almost in like a, a one Germany. So meaning, you know, all the German countries that were you know, currently separated. So like the Aust- the Germans that lived in like Austria, Hungary, the Germans that lived in Poland, the Germans that lived in um, Prussia and, you know, Northern France, all of these areas he believes should be united under one German nation and that it should be a strong German nation. And the only reason that this didn't exist right now, he believed, was because of the cowardice of the German generals who retreated and surrendered at World War I. Um, those were called the November, uh, I believe it's the November criminals or something like that is what they called them, but there was a name for them that they basically blamed the entire loss of World War I on, and then also behind that was the Jews. And it was because of the Jews that their influence to the German government led them to to surrender and to give up so much of their their power and their I guess birthright that Hitler felt Germans deserved and ultimately set the stage for Germany to be this weakened disgraced country that was just primed for a leader to come in and rile the people up and, you know, instill some confidence in them and ultimately bring them back to their former glory. So again, he found all of this within the Nazi party. The Nazi party or the German National Socialist Party was already a very German nationalistic party. It was, uh, it had anti-Semitic views and it was everything. And they really kind of embodied everything that Hitler felt about um, those November um, criminals and about the loss and of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles and the kind of the kneecapping of the German people that happened at the end of World War I. So Hitler decides to join this party and they actually try to take over in a kind of unarmed insurrection, coup d'etat, the Bayern government in Munich. So this was kind of a a major turning point for Hitler. So the Nazi party, there's about 2,000 of them. Um, They're still a very small regional party within Germany. Again, there's lots of parties all across Germany, um, but the Nazi party have failed to to really break out of their shell um, within the region. And they're a a moderate regional power, but they are by no means within the national stage. I mean, there's no national press about the Nazi party, no nothing. Um, They are just a regional power. However, Hitler is as power hungry as ever and as ambitious as ever. And he decides that the best way to move forward would be to just take over the government and take it from those individuals, those uh, military leaders who disgraced the German people who you know, surrendered in World War I and who left the German people with absolutely nothing um, that he should just take it from them. So this did not go very well for Hitler. Um, I believe there were 16 individuals killed and the entire thing was completely squashed. The Nazi party was um, kicked out, they were unable to gain control of the government, and all of the Nazi leaders at the time were searched for and subsequently arrested, including Hitler. Again, can't reiterate, reiterate this enough. In reading this book, I knew nothing about the rise of Hitler to power. So I didn't know he was arrested. And he was arrested and tried for treason which at the time should have had a lifetime ban or or a lifetime in prison sentence. So, I mean, worst case scenario, again, Hitler spends life in prison and the entire world is completely different from the way it is today. Um, You know, the Holocaust never happens and, and all of those things. 
However, there were a lot of individuals within the judicial system that were sympathizers of this November criminals idea that, um, you know, the military leaders had betrayed Germany and they kind of felt sympathy for the Nazi party and their feelings of German nationalism. They felt like, you know, there were some good points that the Nazi party had. It was just, you know, wrong place, wrong time, wrong method. You know, they shouldn't have tried a armed insurrection. And so Hitler um, gets off with a pretty minimal sentence and ends up spending, I believe it was just a little over eight months in jail. And this whole thing was actually a big boost to the Nazi party. So the Nazi party at the time, like I said, was this small regional power and through the um, press that it got from this insurrection, from this coup d'etat, uh, Hitler and the Nazi party all of a sudden had national press. His name was all over all the papers, all across Germany, and even internationally, Hitler was a known figure. And this was a huge boost to Hitler. This could be one of the defining moments of the Nazi party because it gave Hitler the jump from small regional group to national group that he needed to start really gaining traction with the with the Nazi party when he got out of prison. He also took this time in prison to write Mein Kampf. So Mein Kampf is the book that Hitler writes about, I mean, Mein Kampf literally means my struggle in German. Um, that's the direct tr translation. And it is all about his or Hitler's struggle with um, his feelings towards the government and the way that German should be. And it is actually kind of more of like a blueprint of things to come and the path forward that the, um, that the future Fuhrer of Germany sees, to, um, in his goals for the Nazi party and for Germany as a whole. So the author of this book makes a point saying that, if anybody had actually read Mein Kampf and took the time to take it seriously, that they would have been able to foresee a lot of the events leading up, or the events that um, transpired after Hitler came to power, because everything's pretty well laid out in Mein Kampf. And and going through um, some of the quotes and you know listening to portions of that book. You kind of see that, I mean, Hitler wasn't pulling any punches. He knew exactly what he wanted. He stated it from day one, and that was exactly what he was going to do. And so it's kind of interesting that no one really took that seriously, considering some of the threats and some of the goals that he laid out in Mein Kampf. So some of the things that he talked about, again, was the Jewish problem and the eradication of Jews. Um, and he goes on and on about how... Um, the Jews were the, the reason for the fall of Germany and that in order to move forward, that they would have to be eradicated from Germany. In addition to that, he talks about Laban's realm. And Laban's realm, direct translated, I believe means, um, so Laban is living or life, and then realm is room or space, and it's living space. It's the amount of space that Germans need in order to survive and thrive and meet their full potential. And so in Mein Kampf, he talks about how in order to have sufficient Lebensraum for the German Empire, they would need to conquer eastward into Poland, Eastern Europe, and even into Russia in order to provide the just the, the mere you know living space, farming capabilities, you know, water, land, everything that they would need to be a self-sufficient, thriving country so that they can, you know, reach their full potential as Germans. And so everything was pretty laid out. So, you know, had somebody in the U.S. intelligence agency, you know, read that book, you know, looked through it and been like, holy crap, Hitler wants to take <laughs> over all of Eastern Europe and expand its borders. They would have been able to see that happening you know, way before it actually happened and he invaded Poland and eventually kicked off World War II. So the whole armed insurrection known as the Beer Hall Pooch um, 
or the Munich pooch um, that happened was actually very good for Hitler. It provided a lot of press. And again, it was kind of the jumping off point from the Nazi party. Now, from this point forward in history, from the from Hitler getting out of prison, he realized that in order to be a successful party within the German government, that they would have to do everything within the bounds of government, that they couldn't go through anything through you know armed conflict or you know taking things over by force. That if you wanted the the backing of the people, the trust of the people, as well as the stability of um, the government and the stability of you know control over the government that he would have to do everything legally or th- at least through the through the through the path of you know the German legal system and this was true till the day he died so from this point forward everything that Hitler and the Nazi party did was 100% legal at the time that they did it Um, Now, that's not to say that the laws at the very beginning allowed for the Holocaust, but it is to say that by the time that the Holocaust came around, that Hitler was within his legal right to perform all of those actions. And I think that's very interesting. Um, I think that's an interesting distinction that sometimes we think, okay, you know, Hitler, extreme evil, you know, he was a dictator who just took over and did evil things. But that's not necessarily true. Hitler was somebody who used government and used the power afforded to the government by the people to do horrible things. Um, and I think that's an important distinction because it's the difference between you know, somebody doing things by force and somebody doing things through by us allowing people to do something evil. And... I don't think you get to the point where Hitler was without a little bit of, without the people allowing those, those small steps. Now that's not to say that the people that the German people knew um, about the Holocaust and knew that it was coming and they were 100% okay with it, but it is to say that they were um, compliant or complacent with the giving up of more and more power to the Nazi party to the point where anything goes for the fewer. And we'll see here a little bit later on, like why they gave up that freedom, why they gave up that power. But it is important to note that the more and more power that you give up, the more and more capability that those in power have to do evil. And that definitely happened with Hitler and the Nazi party. So now, just moving forward a little bit, Hitler um, is able to kind of turn his small group of political activists into a national German party that's recognized all over Germany. He's out there, you know, campaigning, fundraising, um, getting money. Again, everything in Germany at this time it's a it's known as the Weimar Republic. So it's it, there's there are elections, there are local elections, there are state elections. There's a a Reichstag or like a Congress um, that, you know, they're voting individuals into. And in this time, Hitler is, you know, slowly and slowly becoming a a more popular individual. And the the Nazi party is slowly starting to rise to power. And they did this, this rise to power kind of on two different levels. The first way that they did it was just plain through lies. Um, You know, I think false promises the German Socialist, the German National Socialist Party was a party that didn't have a whole lot of values outside of German nationalism and anti-Semitism. Um, you know, Hitler didn't really concern himself with any sort of economic plans. He, you know, he had somebody within the Nazi Party that, you know, espoused socialist values, but ultimately that didn't concern him at all. Those were the only two values that he would hold firm on everything else he was willing to kind of be a little bit flexible bend the truth and promise you know anything you know he could promise the moon to somebody and didn't care if he didn't deliver the only things that he cared about delivering was that german nationalist um, view of the world you know creating this german uh, world power and then also his anti-semitic views and eliminating the jewish problem 
So this meant that he would promise really anybody anything. He was promising capitalists and business owners that there would be less regulation, that you know if they got elected, that they would help grow the economy within Germany. And then, you know, at the same time to the individuals and to those that really, you know, had socialist views, he was espousing, you know, security. Um, He had um, promised and implemented a social security program. He was, you know, talking about mandatory employment and, you know, minimum wage and things like that. Um, You know, things that ran contrary to the other things that he was promising the capitalists. And so he really wasn't. I, again, he was thrown through just a politician, somebody that would you know throw out false promises and was just trying to gain favor with whatever political group or whatever um, different uh, you know activist group that he possibly could, as long as they would support his German nationalist and anti-Semitic views. So, in addition to the kind of standard lies from uh, politicians that you got, he also used propaganda pretty heavily. And so whenever I think of propaganda, I basically think of the Nazi party. Um, I think they went all in on on propaganda, um, went all in on the media, but I don't think that that is uniquely a German problem. So the, the Nazi party realized pretty early on that the more content that they got out there, and the you know kind of volume of content and the frequency of the content and the consistency of the content that they got out there, the more they could sway the opinions of individuals. So they would work on, I mean, they had so many different publications that they ran constantly pumping out information to the German people. There were publications specifically about anti-Semitism, publications specifically for German nationalism, publications specifically promoting Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party. And they would just constantly pump and pump and pump and pump more and more information into the individual or into the public so that they could, you know, use that to gain gain more and more followers and more and more traction. And this ended up working. So around the time of 1933, the German, uh, the Nazi party had, um, it wasn't the majority within the Reichstag, but it was the largest party within the Reichstag. I want to say it was like 33% of the Reichstag um, or their, you know, Congress was of the Nazi party. The second largest group being the communists. And they were looking for a way to expand their expand their influence. And I think at the time Hitler was the chancellor or like equivalent to the United States president. Um, and again, they had a, not a majority, but a, a large share of the Reichstag. And they were not satisfied with this because they couldn't move their agenda forward. There were still checks and balances. And so... Basically, they were looking for any sort of reason or catastrophe to seize power. And so on February 27th, the German parliament building, or the Reichstag, burned down. And when Hitler arrived on the scene, he stated, this is the first thing he stated. He said, if this fire, as I believe, is the work of communists, then we must crush out this murderous pest with an iron fist. So the Nazi party and its coalition of partners just claimed that the communists that the communists were the ones who started the fire and then used that threat to seize power. So I believe the saying is never let a crisis go to waste or something like that and the German or the Nazi party just jumped right onto this crisis. So and they had a scapegoat for the whole thing. His name was, um, let me find it here, uh, Maria, Marinus van der, van der Lube. He was a Dutch construction worker and communist sympathizer and known, um, what's it called when you set buildings on fire? Um, I keep wanting to say pyromaniac, but I know that that's not it. But yeah, I mean, he liked to um, he liked to set buildings on fire, and 
they pinned basically this whole thing on him and tied it to the communists and basically used this as a way to beat down the communist party. Now, it hasn't been 100% confirmed that it was the Nazi party that started the fire. However, due to testimonies that came out during the Nuremberg trials, eyewitness statements, and just the general nature of the way that the fire started and got big so quickly, it is pretty much assumed that the Nazi party actually manufactured this incident in order to you know, create a crisis that would allow them to seize power. So they were able to um, claim emergency leg legislation um, in order to you know, f prevent future attacks on the German government. And they issued a decree that placed constraints on the press, um, limiting free speech. They authorized the police to ban political meetings and marches of political rivals. And they also gave a decree that gave the national government more authority over the states and local offices and gave them the ability to you know, kick local and state office leaders out of power. So they really went all in on this Reichstag fire and they just took over as, and seized as much power as they possibly could. So they saw that opportunity and they capitalized on it. And eventually they started throwing all of the communists into into prison. I want to say it was like 3,000 or 6,000 communists that they ended up throwing into prison. They took all of those empty and vacant spots that were um, held by past communists and filled them with Nazi party members and eventually just gained a, you know, a majority foothold over the government. And all of this was done because they were able to use the fear um, of a kind of a coup d'etat fear of somebody going in and, and taking over the government. And then they just kept pushing that propaganda out through their propaganda outlets and through the media saying that, you know, watch out, the communists are after you, the communists are after you, they're, you know, they're going to weaken Germany. And they ended up getting the support of the people so that, um, you know, they were able to pass all of this legislation. So once they had power, over the government and they could you know, pass legislation, what they ended up doing was creating these unelected, um, unregulated branches of the government that would be able to pass, reg pass legislation. And the only veto power for any of these unregulated, unelected or groups was Hitler himself. So essentially, they created a secondary government on top of the first government that just could bypass um, any sort of electorate or you know opinion of the people, and they essentially created a unstoppable government that could do whatever it wanted. And this was just kind of the precursor government to eventually when Hitler would you know, seize all power as Fuhrer, become the commander in chief of the army, the lord of all the lands, and eventually to the point where the author of the book says that Hitler was able to seize so much power within Germany that he had power to say whether or not any German lived or died. Um, that it was written within in the law that Hitler could decide if an individual was, you know, hindering or furthering the path of the or the, the future of the German nationalists and the German party and that he could ultimately decide the punishment meaning that he could kill anybody that he wanted for any reason as long as he deemed it that they were hindering the German nationalist cause and that basically gave him ultimate authority to do whatever he wanted, which made all of the Holocaust and all of the concentration camps and the prisoner of wars and everything that he did completely legal within the German system. And it was a, you know, a, a slow collection of power that was given to, to Hitler over time by the people. So, but that didn't happen instantaneously. So it wasn't like Hitler and the Nazi party gained power and then it all of a sudden just turned into this, you know, hellhole landscape. And that's kind of initially what I thought. I was like, man, it must have sucked to live 
in the Third Reich as Hitler came to power. And that's not necessarily true. So, you know, Hitler did do some things to help, I guess, not distract the people, but I be- I think it was more of a trade, trade-off. So he was giving the German people security and giving them the opportunity to have luxury in life, and they were in turn trading their freedoms away. So Hitler was seizing more and more power, and the people, the German people were happy to give it to them because he was giving them you know, different things. He had created this department within Germany that was called the Labor of Love, um, which kind of reminds me of 1984 and like some of the uh, the departments within like the Ministry of Truth and the Ministry of Love. And, and it kind of makes sense that that's what it was called because uh, George Orwell was, you know, greatly influenced by World War II. I mean, he wrote 1984 and 1949 right after the end of World War II. Um, so it kind of makes sense that he pulled a lot from history and included that in his book. But the labor of love was a department within the party that basically was used to distract the German people. And so Hitler created the labor of love in order to you know, provide uh, sporting events and recreational events for Germans, um, for German workers. It also provided um, art um, events and, you know, cultural events at discounted rates for, um, German workers. It even went as far as to provide like vacation for workers. Um, so German workers could actually purchase discounted vacations where they could take holidays and go to, you know, foreign countries and, they, you know, all expense va- paid vacations and, and things like that. And it was part of this German program to, you know, have, the morale of the German people increased while at the same time Hitler was slowly taking away their freedoms. And I think a lot of times we think like, how could the German people get to a point where they, you know, basically trusted Hitler to be a dictator. And I don't think it was so much that they looked at Hitler and they were like, you're the guy, we want you to be our dictator. But through reading this book, what I, what I've realized is that it was a slow trade of one, a, a trade of security and a trade of you know some small luxuries for our, for freedoms, but at the same time it was also you know Hitler was taking some of the responsibility of the German people's failures away from them, and he was you know promising them that they would you know be a world power again, and that he was you know steering them in a direction that was going to lead them to be you know, great once again. And all of those things were things that you know they were willing to trade their freedom for and trade their um, you know their ability to vote and their ability to um, you know have a voice within government and give it to an individual who is giving them all of these wonderful things. And I think sometimes, we fall into that same trap for sure here in the United States. Like we, we definitely can, can be sold on, on security and sold on, you know, luxuries in exchange for our freedoms. And I just don't think that that's good because you never know what those individuals are going to do with that freedom. And that is exactly what Hitler did. So Hitler then took all of this power and he started conquering all of, you know, all of the Sudetenlands, conquering and annexing Austria into Germany, you know, basically destroying Czechoslovakia and, you know, annexing Slovakia into Germany and collecting all of these German nationalist groups or the German people that he believed should all exist under one, one Germany and bringing them together. And then kind of that, the line in the sand moment of World War II happened when, It was Germany had collected as much land as they possibly could. And the allied partners, France and Great Britain, had basically said, you know, we're trying to avoid another world war. So we're just going to kind of not get involved in this. This is a problem for the German people. And, you know, those people are basically Germans anyway. So we're just going to let that happen. But the line in the sand was Poland. 
And that was the start of World War II when Germany invaded Poland. And I always knew that that was the start of World War II, was Germany invading Poland and the Allied forces then saying that, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And that's kind of where everything started kicking off. Then after Poland, Germany invaded France and then, you know, invaded Russia and North Africa really started expanding from there. However, what I didn't know and what I learned from this book again was everything leading up to World War II. It was the why and the how. It was why Germans felt like, and specifically Hitler and Nazis, felt like they needed the expansion. They needed more Lebensraum. They felt like they deserved it. Um, and then the how did somebody gain so much power within that nation that at the time was a republic and a democratic republic? How did they gain so much power and influence in order to basically have a unanimous decision of, yes, we're going to invade Poland, regardless of the consequences. And that was the part of the book that I found the most interesting. Now, the rest of this book kind of goes on and continues throughout World War II and talks about all the different battles and, um, you know, Hitler's genius in battle early on in the war. And then how, you know, later on in the war, he basically believed that the German people could not be beat, which led to some poor decisions and eventually led to the downfall of the German armies. And, you know, Russia then start, starts making its way back into Germany and encircles the Reichstag and encircles Berlin and leads to the ultimate demise of Hitler. And so the book goes through in great detail over everything. So if you really, really are interested in kind of an, a historical account of the rise and fall of the Third Reich, then read the book. Um, do just what I did and spend the time and actually read the book and get as much out of it as you can. But I didn't really want this podcast to be, you know, a, a historical account of everything that happened. I just wanted to highlight a few things that I felt like was you know, important to know and that had, you know, a significant impact on the way that I view things here in the United States currently. And I also want to take a quick second to, to highlight a couple factors of the Holocaust. So the book does not go into great detail about the Holocaust. That is one thing that I will say. Um, it is definitely more of a political and wartime strategy um, book that talks a lot more about why and how Hitler was able to gain power and what he did with that power. But it doesn't talk a whole lot about the, the Holocaust. I mean, there definitely is a section, and I want to say it's probably a couple of hours long. But in comparison to all of the other sections of the book, it just really isn't that big of a focus of the book. Um, but there were definitely some things in the book that was kind of almost too shocking to not share. And so I wanted to point out some of the horrors that were able to take place because of the Nazi party and because of the amount of power that Hitler was able to have over every person who lived within the German empire. And in addition to that, you know, kind of the ideals that Hitler had from his youth of this anti-Semitic and German nationalist views that led him to do some of these horrific things. So first off, Five million Jews were killed in concentration camps. That is an insane amount of people that were killed. Um, I go back and I think of just, I'm, I'm originally from Alaska, and there aren't even one million people that live in the whole state of Alaska. So, I mean, that's like six or seven times as many people that lived in the whole state um, that would be killed in those years um, who were just Jews. Um, in addition to the amount of people that were killed, um, it was also kind of shocking and disturbing um, as to like the inhumane nature as to, you know, how they felt towards the Jews. So they felt like the Jews and as well, you know, the Poles and some of the prisoner of wars that were captured, that they were no longer humans, that they were, I think the word is unter, untermenschen, which is like under humans, meaning that they were less than men. And so because of that, um, and because of the, their views on the Jewish problem, they were, I mean, they were absolutely ruthless. They would make skin, or they would use this, 
collect the skin of Jews and make lampshades um, for people who collected skin lampshades. And they would specifically search after people who had tattoos and make lampshades with them. Um, they also would perform experience experiments on them and they would, um, you know, put them into pressure chambers to see what the limits of the human body are and find out, you know, how much pressure can a human withstand. They would also do freezing, um, freezing experiments on them and see what the limits of the human body are with freezing and rewarming. Um, there were accounts of people sleeping in dog kennels. Um, so prisoners of war from France specifically um, would sleep in five men slept in one dog kennel and they were three feet wide, nine feet long or no, sorry. They were three feet tall, nine feet long and six feet wide. And they'd have to crawl in them and they would sleep five people to, to one kennel. Um, again, they were, they used the, again, they just didn't even view these individuals as humans. They used the ashes as fertilizer um, and they would, you know, collect all the ashes from the burnt humans and use them as fertilizer. The furnaces, they burned so many individuals that the furnaces couldn't even keep up in Auschwitz. So they would burn an estimated anywhere from six to 16,000 people per day. Um, and the furnaces just couldn't burn them fast enough that they, that, and get the people get through enough individuals, um, that were dying in these camps. And, there was a quote given, and I can't remember by who, I wish I knew, but it was one of the German um, leaders who was in charge of the um, prisoners of war and also anybody who lived in Poland that was being captured. Um, and basically anybody in all the concentration camps, he was in charge of all of them. And he said, whether 10,000 Roman... Russian women collapse with exhaustion and construction of the anti-tank ditch for Germany only interests me insofar as the ditch gets dug for Germany. That quote hit me pretty hard. Um, you know, this, I mean, I think a lot of times we think that this, this level of pure evil can never, ever happen again. Um, and we sometimes think like it's, especially here in the United States, just not possible for that to exist or for that to happen. And I think that if we don't study history and we don't take a look at where we are and what we're doing and draw parallels to history, then we are destined to repeat it. Um, I think there was a quote from, I believe the first time I heard it, and I think it was quoted on this documentary, but it was a documentary from 180 degrees South, which is like a surfing documentary about Patagonia and North face, um, that I watched on Netflix. And I, one of the quotes that they say in that movie is the, the only lesson from history is that men don't learn from history or something along those lines that, you know, really people just don't learn from history. And so if we are to to think that that'll never ever happen again. The only way to guarantee that it won't ever happen again and that and that these things and these atrocities will never happen again is that we learn from the mistakes um, and from the activities of the Nazi party and of the German people that um, led to the, the, the Fuhrer and Hitler to be, to have absolute, control and power over this people um, to carry out his wish and his demand and his insane goal of German or Jewish eradication and German nationalism. And so, again, I think it's important that we draw some parallels to American politics while reading this. And that's kind of why I chose some of these stories that I was going through earlier it's because they were the ones that really stood out to me most um, to draw parallels from. And again, I don't want to draw specific parallels to specific people or specific groups. I don't want this to be, you know, a, an attack the Democrats or attack the Republicans or attack Trump or or whatever. Um, but I do think it's important that we look at every 
every event leading towards that and see if that's something that you know we're currently falling prey to now. And so I just want to point out a couple of those things that came from those stories. So first, um, the first thing was, you know, a charismatic leader who support, whose support must be unwavering, um, that they found that within Hitler, that Hitler was this guy who could do no wrong and that he led the party and he was charismatic and it didn't really matter what he said. Um, again, he could be talking about eradicating Jews and the Jewish problem and it didn't really matter because people really did like Hitler. And that it wasn't so much his policies or his, you know, grasp for power that was important. It was, you know, Hitler was a, you know, a likable guy who was a good speaker and could and can move the people. And I think that that's always a little bit dangerous when you when you like people over policies and you like people over um, actual actions. And um, you know, you definitely they definitely fell prey to that with Hitler. Um, the second one was the control of press and information. So as you can see with the Reichstag fire, the German people took the, t um, or the German government and the Nazi government specifically created laws to limit the press um, the moment that there was any sort of crisis. They took that moment and seized the press and then they just were able to pump out propaganda constantly. And this lasted the entire length of world war ii so i mean even up until invading poland the german people believed that the reason why germany invaded poland was because poland shot first and hitler stated that that was why um and then just used the press to pump out lies and lies and lies and so again that was a major reason to the support of Hitler and again the the giving up of freedoms and the following of the Nazi party was because they were getting fed lies constantly through the press and through propaganda. Um, again, the use of a crisis or even a manufactured crisis to seize power. So it's important that we recognize when people are using using events to to gain power and influence. I think we saw that pretty significantly during the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, the Patriot Act and things like that. And even more recently, there have definitely been some some actions that have been used that the government uses to just take a little bit more of our power, take a little bit more of our freedom, and they justify it under the kind of the guise of protection. Um, and I just, I just think that that was a tactic used by the Nazis and we should definitely be weary of that, um, um, that tactic. And then the legal prosecution of enemies to gain power. Again, that was something used by the Nazis once they kind of deemed the communists as evil and that they were attacking and, and they said, you know, the communists were attacking the German people, attacking German government, attacking German democracy, they kind of labeled them as evil, this group that was trying to overthrow the government. And then it, it allowed for these politicians to use any means necessary. You know, it, nothing, nothing was out of the question. Um, kind of, it was, it was better that they would prosecute these individuals and send them to jail than the alternative, which was that the communists would come through and and destroy the German government. And and again, they would the inability to kind of have a fair trial and to uh, voice your opinion and your dissent and and the prosecution of your enemies is is always it's always a bad thing. I think the best the best disinfectant for for bad ideas is is good ideas. And the only way to hear contrary ideas is to have political opponents and political discourse. And so if you're just constantly attacking and delegitimizing and, you know, trying to get, you know, trying to keep people from being able to share their opinions, then you never have the opportunity to, to voice your opinion in a constructive way. You're just too busy destroying your opponents. And I think that's what the Nazis did. You know, they weren't out there talking about how great the Nazi party was. Instead, they were out there, again, delegitimizing and attacking and incarcerating the opponent. And then again, which we've talked about, or I've talked about frequently is the trading freedom for security. Um, I think there is no greater security than freedom. 
And sometimes we, we, we forget that because freedom, the freedom to choose also brings, you know, the freedom to choose bad things and the freedom to choose hardship. But ultimately it leads towards the tre- freedom to, to choose good things and the freedom to choose success and prosperity. And if you don't have that freedom, then it's way worse. And that is, it's never a fair trade to trade freedoms for securities. Um, the other thing that the German people and the Nazi party fell prey to was, you know, finding a scapegoat for everything. I think it's important that you kind of own up to your actions and that sometimes we recognize that not all decisions that have been made throughout history and not all decisions that have been made even recently are always the best decisions. Um, the German people used the Jews as kind of their scapegoat for everything. It was because of the Jews that um, they lost World War One. It was because of the Jews that um, the British government decided to attack um, and join into the war. And it was because of the Jews that the that the Russians needed to be conquered and that the Russians turned on them. And it was because of the Jews that all of these problems ever happened for the Germans and they were unable to own up to their mistakes. And if without owning up to your mistakes, then you can't learn and grow from them. And it just kind of snowballs into worse and worse and worse mistakes to where, you know, that you can justify almost anything because of the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. And so we just need to make sure that, you know, as a, as an individual and as a country that we're not, that we're owning up to our actions, you need to take responsibility for the things that happen and move forward. Um, you know, knowing that you can be better every single day. Um, and then lastly, the seizure of power by a national government. So, I mean, that was, I mean, that is the story of the Nazi party is, I mean, an absurdly fast seizure of government. Uh, I think they said it was six months from the moment that Hitler was made chancellor to the moment that he was the Fuhrer. Um, That's insane. Uh, I mean, that's not even, (laughs) I mean, you're still in school. So you, you, you start school and the fall and you know before you are out of that school year you went from a democracy to a complete dictatorship um i mean they have to rewrite all the textbooks and it was absurdly fast and it happened because the government kept was able to just keep pulling and seizing power from the state governments pulling that from local governments replacing judges replacing um elected officials with unelected officials and seizing more and more and more power for the state for the national government and whether or not you think that your form of national government is good because the Nazis felt like their government was good, that they were doing the right thing for Germany, or whether you think it's bad because you think, you know, no one individual should have that power or, you know, because that they're doing something bad with the power that they've been given, it doesn't really matter. Um, nobody should have that power to begin with. And you see here that with all of that power, it only you only ever want more and more and more and more power. Um, nobody ever gets to a point where they're like, okay, you know what, I'm done. I'm done with the power. I'm ready to to leave leave some of this up to the states. And it got to the point in Germany where the national power was whether or not they could kill millions and millions and millions of Jews. Um, you know, they just kept acquiring more and more power. So it's important that you kind of cut that off early and that you say, okay, no. Some of the powers with the states, some of the powers with the government, um, and it's not worth giving the government power and for any reason uh, whatsoever. So that is my take on the book, and that is why I picked you know some of those different um, stories out of the book, and some of the things that I see going on in in our political and social landscape today, and some of the things that are being fought about by elected officials, unelected officials. And I just think it's important, again, that we take the time to read about history and read of the pitfalls of some of these actions before we fall, you know, too deep down the rabbit hole and, and, you know, give more and more and more power to these, to these individuals. And that's not to say, 
I'm anti-government or anything. I, you know, I definitely, you know, love living in this country and think that we've got an amazing thing going. I just, you know, want to make sure that it keeps going on and on and on, um, and that we can do good by it, um, and live up to the ideals of our founding fathers. And overall, I would say this book, um, definitely reinforced that for me. And I enjoyed reading it because of that. I enjoyed reading it with kind of the lens of, you know, comparing things to the modern world. And I think that that's why this book is important. So if I had to rank this book, I would say probably give it like a seven overall. Um, importance, maybe like an eight and readability. Well, maybe I'd give it a six overall. Uh, yeah, probably a six overall oh, with an importance at like eight and a readability at like five. Um because it was, it was really long. <laughs> it was really long. Um, but the information in it is very, very important. And again, we have to learn from history. So I enjoyed this book. I don't think I'd rank it in my top 10. I uh, don't think I'd put it on a list of, I might put it on a list of must reads, but it is a book that I'll probably have to read again in order to really get more out of it. I think I learned from this book also that I do really enjoy kind of historical fiction. Um, I like kind of the pacing and this like emotional connection that comes from historical fiction. Although I will read more and more, you know, nonfiction books and historical books. I just am slowly realizing that that's not my absolute favorite genre of book, but it is important to read. So thank you for listening to me ramble for what's now been a little over an hour and I tried to keep this one a little bit shorter. Uh, I don't think I succeeded. I know it's been kind of long, but I wanted to take the time to really dive into a couple stories out of this book. And um, you know, definitely please like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what your thoughts are on the individual podcast. Let me know if this is something that you enjoyed, whether or not I should just scrap it and only do guests, which means that Olivia, my wife, will end up being a guest on a lot of my podcasts um, for the time being. And then also, if you are listening to this and you're interested or know somebody who would be interested in being a guest and just loves reading or loves a specific book and knows a lot about it, please let me know. would love to talk to them. Um, thank you. And again, please subscribe and stay tuned to the channel. Thanks.